Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live, the longest running weekly photography live stream on YouTube. If you're watching live, you know the drill probably. Please leave me a note in the chat. It's probably over there. Let me know where you are watching from and who you are, of course. And by the way, if you're watching the replay, no worries. You're an important part of this process. Please leave a comment below the video so that I know you were here. So far this week, uh, let's see, we got Blair uh, checking in here. We got Ron from Thursday this week in uh, Australia, Carl from Illinois. I got, uh, let's see, Blair was in Canada, Cooley's in Hobart, Indiana, Jay in Southern Colorado, Ty in New Jersey, Lynn in New York, Calvin up in Maine, Sandra in Alberta, uh, Zoltan is here from, gosh, where's Zoltan from? I don't know where Zoltan's from. Um, and I got Robert here in the UK. Uh, let's see, Scott just snuck in here from Arizona and Jimbo from Illinois. All of you, thank you. Sergio down in Austin, Texas. Great to see all of you. So we're going to dive right in. I got a couple uh, news pieces this week that are, uh, you know, kind of important to me. So let's hit those first. Uh, the first one, <laughs> not really that important, but, you know, it's worth mentioning. Um, article in Petapixel, actually, I believe, yeah, today, uh, apparently the latest camera sales stats are out. So for those of you that care, uh, in Japan, Sony, the most popular camera, followed by Canon number two, and OM system still hanging in there in Japan with number three. Um, interestingly, missing from that top three, Nikon and Fuji do not seem to be able to put a dent into that. You would, you would kind of think that, you know, these APS-C and full-frame folks would be able to knock OM systems out, but not in Japan. And by the way, for you DSLR shooters, and especially if you're a Pentax shooter, it's worth noting that the Pentax monochrome camera is in the top three of DSLR sales in Japan. So there you go. That's where things are at. Not that that changes any of your photography, but for the few of you who probably do not tune into this show, but if you're the ones that, you know, have to have the best, the biggest, whatever's on the top of the list, there you go. Time to go sell your gear, start over. All right. Um, I did want to mention because this is a topic that is kind of near and dear to my heart. The last week and a half or so have been really, really tough for photojournalism. Um, article came out today, the Los Angeles Times laid off 115 newsroom staffers, uh, of which 25% um, of that uh, it amounts to, excuse me, it amounts to more than 20% of its current newsroom. It includes writers and photographers as well as other vital positions. This is coming on the heels of Sports Illustrated uh, pretty much closing its doors, not officially, but getting rid of pretty much all of its staff. Um, I mean, just think about, think about the Sports Illustrated covers. I mean, for me, growing up, uh, as a teen, and I'm, I'm not a huge sports person, but you know, as a teenager, and then in my 20s, shooting newspaper work, watching the Sports Illustrated covers, and of course, following photographers like Walter Yost, Neil Leifer, um, these guys were the gods, and the, these these images that made the Sports Illustrated covers were incredible. But uh, the reason that I reason I bring this up, and this is about as close as I'm going to get the politics. Because I've got to say the T word to talk about this. We should all care about this. I, not just as photographers. The, this fact that photojournalism is... I don't want to say it's disappearing. Because I don't think it's going to disappear. But the outlets for good photojournalism. And more importantly, the outlets for good photojournalism to be impactful in the world... Are disappearing. That's the part we need to care about. Look, I will be the first to say newspapers, uh, publications like Sports Illustrated, Time, Newsweek, all those, on one hand, so listen close because I'm going to talk in two different directions, right? On one hand, those, those publications deserve to fail. They deserve to fail. 
newspapers especially, the internet came along in the 1990s and they continued business as usual like it couldn't impact them, which was the same stupid decision that print publications made with regards to television in the 60s and 70s. And then when Ted Turner came along with 24-7 cable news and they still thought it's not going to have an impact. Wow. You know, what is the definition of stupidity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. But here's why we need to care. And, and this is a perfect example. And we all know, so again, no politics. Anybody that's going to dump politics in here is just going to get bounced out of the comments, right? But this has happened before it'll happen again and it's not just going to happen from this man because eventually it will happen from others even from the other party if it suits them right so that's why i'm saying we're not going to get into politics but you know the perfect example here are two images that this photojournalist transmitted via ap right one at the front of the room and there are some people standing right and then one at the back of the room, which there's actually also another image along the way that you can find on Twitter where you see more of the back of the room and you realize this is just a small piece of the back of the room. There's a lot more at the back of the room that's empty. And of course, guess who is, oh, you know what? I'm telling you all about these pictures and I'm not showing you. Gosh, my, I'm sorry. So this was the article that I was referencing. Sorry. Uh, here are the two photographs. One showing the front of the room. And again, there are some people standing in the front of the room. Right? That is a fact. You can see that. Other one showing the back of the room. As I mentioned, this is actually a small portion of the back of the room. There are some images on Twitter that were posted by some other news sources that show the full depth of the back of the room. Um, and, you know, said presidential candidate, of course, uh, is very upset, has come out and, you know, gone to the root of name calling of this photojournalist and claiming that he's lying and claiming that all of those empty seats are seats that belong to these people standing up front, right? Here's the thing with that. That's not true. And it's not true for a simple reason. The fact that these people are standing up front, that was planned. That was planned long before said candidate ever arrived in the building. Otherwise, Secret Service would have decked or shot those people when they came forward to the stage. It would not have been allowed. So it was the setup that the campaign planned, notified and negotiated with Secret Service. And the simple fact of the matter is they didn't fill the room. Now, the irony of it is, is not filling the room because, hey, look, if you look at a lot of, you know, the other candidates on the other party, you know, a lot of his events, he was about 20 miles down the road from me a couple of weeks ago. There were just a couple hundred people out in the cold to watch him. And most of the places he went, he only talked with like five, 10, maybe 20 people. Ironically, it's this candidate that makes the issue out of crowd size but then has to, you know, resort to name calling. So that gang is why we should care about these outlets for photojournalism failing and disappearing because we're all worse off for it. That being said, let's move on to our quote of the week. All right, this week, I have a quote for you from a French photographer, uh, and this is a photographer that's not uh, particularly well known um, commercially. Uh, incredible photographer, uh, definite historical significance here. The quote and the photographer, let me switch this over. Oops, wrong one. There we go. A good picture knows how to communicate the emotion that created it by Willie Ronan. So Willie Ronan, he lived from 1910 to 2009. He was a prominent French photographer who was renowned for uh, his both poetic and humanistic approach to photography. 
Uh, his images often were almost kind of street photography in nature, capturing everyday life in post-war Paris. And those images remain iconic today in terms of their documenting that time period in history in Paris. Um, his work reflected a deep empathy for subjects and also his ability to convey beauty through his lens. So I will share a link with you momentarily here uh, where you can learn more about Willie Ronis. Also see it's in the chat. It's also in the description below the video already. Um, you can uh, see his images by clicking this link that you see right there. Um, check out a Wikipedia page about him. It's got a lot of background information, uh, some videos about him and his work. Every one of these pages about photographers has some cool trivia tidbits about the photographers as well as their bio and links to books about their photography. Um, you can find all of these on my website, joelman.com. It's forward slash photographers. I'm also going to share that link with you. Uh, in case you don't follow me on Facebook, Twitter, X, whatever we're calling it today, LinkedIn, um, and Instagram, every day, Monday through Friday, I post a quote from a well-known photographer along with a link that will allow you to learn more about that photographer as well as see some of their work. These photographers are curated by me as photographers that I really sincerely believe you will find value in studying their work and their career paths. Um, also, just a little heads up, I know for a few weeks I was telling you that you could also see the quotes on Instagram at 80% photography. Uh, I shut down that profile today and boy, I gotta tell you, oh, it feels so good to shut down a social media profile. Uh, I started it for the photo quotes. I uh, did not have a lot of success getting it to pick up traction. And since it's not a key part of my business model, so please hear the lessons here, right? Um, since it's not a key part of my business model, uh, there really was no value in me continuing that. You can, however, see the quotes daily on all the social platforms I mentioned, Facebook, X, um, um, let's see, LinkedIn, also Threads, and Blue Sky, one of the newer social media platforms, which uh, I will always try out new platforms when they come. But um, if you follow me on Instagram, which you should be following me on Instagram because all of my Instagram posts are lessons, right? So you swipe and there's lessons. In fact, I'm going to show you one of them tonight for the shop breakdown. But um, you will see the photo quotes in my Instagram stories every day. So you'll still be, to get, be able to get them on Instagram. And the best part is from Instagram stories, you can click on the story. There's a link in the story that will take you to that page that is on my website. All right. So quick reminder, all of you. Yes, you right there. I put the coffee down. You, yes. You are part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And seriously, it would help a lot more people learn about The Last Frame if you could just do me a simple solid, hit the thumbs up that's down below the video. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends the show to other photographers. All right, so our topic tonight, our topic for uh, the entire show, how much light do you really need to shoot awesome portraits? So, you know, is it 200 watt seconds, 300 watt seconds, 400 watt seconds, 600 watt seconds? Can I shoot with speed lights? Will LED works? Will LEDs work? Excuse me. Uh, how much is too much and how much is not enough? So, this is in response to a question. Speaking of questions, by the way, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A tonight. Like, I'm hoping to get a good 30-minute Q&A in. So if you're here, I saw Blair's got a question in. Uh, I think maybe Nick's got something in there. Uh, how can I help you? If you're here, post a question. It can be a topic that would be beneficial to you or a specific question. But type away. So back to lighting. Uh, I had someone um, reach out to me via Instagram. 
earlier today. They said they may not be able to make it here tonight. But uh, I think it's a great topic to talk about. I've talked about it before in a lot of different ways. Um, this particular person that reached out is kind of setting up a small studio space. And uh, I don't even remember the size. It's small. And the size doesn't matter in this case, kind of, right? So since this particular photographer is going to be getting their first lighting, they're currently, they have two speed lights, but they're not both the same power and they don't interact well and that they, their question was, you know, would they be better off using like Godox 8200s like I do, or should they look at the 300s? What's the best thing to do? So there's a couple things that you are going to use. Here's my criteria. And there's several caveats through this. In other words, uh, I'm going to give you what I sincerely recommend as my um, best tips. But some of these best tips are going to depend on your particular situation. So the first thing is, if you haven't already bought a ton of lighting, so that's first and foremost, because the short answer to the question, how much light is enough? Literally, you don't need a lot of light. Speed lights are more than ample light for portraits and even in studio. And when I say in studio, I mean indoors. So more than enough light for portraits and even indoor modeling and fashion photography. One or two people in the shot, studio type settings. Speed lights are more than enough. And that's still talking about working at low base ISOs, et cetera, right? So the short answer is right there. You don't need a ton of light. In fact, I'd rather invest my money, not to jump ahead here, I'd rather invest my money on variations of light as opposed to tons of power. Now, if you're new, and if you're just researching this stuff, one of the questions that should be right on the tip of your tongue right now is, well, if I don't need a whole lot more than a speed light, why do they make lights that are 400 watt seconds, 600 watt seconds, even all the way up to like 1200 watt seconds and even more than that? Well, there is no one size fits all light, just like there's no one size fits all camera, no one size fits all lens, it works for every photographer for everything. There just isn't. Now, some photographers, depending on what they shoot, can get away with one lens that may do everything for them. Some photographers, depending on what they shoot, may be able to get away with one particular power or one particular type of light for everything they shoot. Yes. But if we're looking at the word creativity, Variety is the spice of life. That's where it's going to come from because that variety gives you more tools. So I'm not saying, hey, you got to go out and spend tons and tons and tons of money. No, I am saying, though, save money. Don't buy more light than you need. So who would need these really big lights, like a 600 watt second strobe? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave my favorite answer till last. The type of photographer that would need a light like that is potentially an architectural photographer who's got to do a shot of a building at night, but that building is not well lit. In other words, it's normal landscape lighting is not particularly flattering to the building. So they're going to have to take lights out and they are going to have to light that building. Now, 600 watt second strobes or 1200 watt second strobes will make it a little bit easier and maybe a little bit faster. But it's also important to tell you, so now I'm going to talk to the other side. I can do it with a speed light. I'm just going to have to set my shot up a little bit differently and it's going to take me a little bit longer to walk down along that building, popping that flash multiple times and essentially painting the building with light. But it can't be done. So I use that example because it's a great example of one of the big questions you have to ask yourself when we talk about power. I hear from so many photographers who are coming out of the phase now where they had to go out at high noon and photograph a subject and make the background dark. 
because they wanted to be able to shoot at like f2.8 or 1.8 at high noon and have that creamy bokeh background so that in the end their picture looked like they cut the person out with a pair of scissors and pasted them on a blurry background. You know, that technique that everybody was doing for quite some time, right? Well, a lot of those photographers have finally given up on it. It's, it's burned itself out, thank God, okay? But anytime you see somebody doing that now, all you gotta do is just point out to them, 2017 called and they want their blurry backgrounds back, right? Just is what it is. So, but here's the thing, right? Now those photographers are realizing they've got these massively expensive and big and heavy strobes that they don't really need that much power, right? So one of the things you have to ask yourself, and we're gonna, use, we're gonna stick with that architectural scenario for a minute. Even if you potentially are gonna have to go light that building, how often are you gonna have to light it? If you're not an architectural photographer, it may never happen at all, if it ever happens. So you're gonna buy a light that's that big just in case, right? So these are the kinds of things that you've got to think through. In other words, you know, what are your priorities? Uh, for the gentleman that asked me the question about what lights would, you know, I encourage him to look at. If you take a look at my Instagram profile and even the shot breakdown that I'm going to share with all of you tonight, you'll see that the overwhelming majority of my images, and when I say overwhelming, I'm talking about 99%. If they're shot with strobe, they're shot with Godox 8200s. Occasionally, there are a few images that I have used the Godox 8300 as the key light. Just the key light. All the rest of the lights in the shot are 8200s. Okay? And the only reason I have that 8300 is because it was given to me to test a couple of years ago by Godox. Right? That's it. So I didn't buy it. Uh, I also do own two Godox AD 400s, which I actually regret buying. I purchased them for background lights. I use them for the background, not the foreground. You don't need your brightest light as your key light ever. Think about that. That confuses a lot of people. The reason why you want your more powerful lights for your background is because the background lights are the ones that are probably gonna be further from the subject, from, from the background, than your key light is. Your key light's gonna be really close to the subject for the most part, right? The background lights are generally gonna be further from the background and oftentimes you're gonna put colored gels on those background lights, which reduces the power of the light. So it makes more sense to have the more powerful light in the back, not in the front. Just saying, right? Um, but, I, at this point, I, I hardly ever use them. They're still mounted in my studio. In fact, I can tell you factually, the batteries are dead. I have not charged them in a while because I simply have not used them. I've been using Godox 8200s. It's just easier, it's simpler, it's faster. Done, right? So, um, but here's the key thing. I, I, I'm going through these examples because I first want this photographer and any other photographer that's looking to make these kinds of, of changes, I want them to understand that um, the way you're going to decide, like, what's the best system, how powerful should it be, is based on the kinds of photography that you intend to do the most of, and, and also what is your style within that, right? Because if you're still hanging on to 2017, and you want to go out and shoot at 1.8 on high-speed sync at high noon because you're too lazy to find a little bit of shade and a nice background, then you're going to have to spend more money, and you're going to have to carry bigger, heavier lights, you're not going to have a choice, right? So, so that's a style and a process choice. But uh, here's what you do want to do. Don't buy Godox because I use Godox. Don't buy Profoto because another photographer uses Profoto. Because unless you're making a crap ton of money, you're an idiot to buy Profoto. Period. You just are. Don't buy Westcott because it's grossly overpriced. And it's Chinese stuff that's patched together. Legit. You can go buy Chinese versions of those strobes on Alibaba for a lot less money. The, the only thing that Westcott really brought to the table there is their, their trigger that is camera agnostic, right? Meaning it'll work on any camera brand. That is a nice feature. But a company like Godox combats that by keeping their triggers inexpensive. Their most expensive triggers like $89 
and their their cheaper ones are like 49 and 69. They're not breaking the bank with their triggers. So if you're one of those crazy people that changes camera brands every two years, because keep in mind, it, none of it's a problem unless you change camera brands all the time, right? Because you're only going to buy it once. Just saying. But if you're one of those crazy people that changes camera brands all the time and you go with God, that's okay. So you're only out, you know, 60, 80 bucks. And trust me, you're throwing away a lot more than that when you're changing camera brands. You just are. So honestly, the, the best deal in the market, in my opinion, and I make no money from them. They've never paid me a dime. In fact, the company that gave me that Godax 300 uh, that I mentioned was not Godax. It was a retailer, right? Um, I own a lot of Godax product. I've paid for all of it. Full price. And when I say full price, I certainly, I like watch for sales. Um, some of it is the Flashpoint brand that I purchased from Adorama. Some of it is straight up Godox brand that I purchased where somebody was, you know, having a sale. Um, but I have like, I believe 10 of the Godox 8200s. I have the two 400s and I have the one 300. I have, I have a lot of lights and, and I actually use them. The shot that I'm going to show you tonight, I have five lights in it, right? So I, I, I use a lot of the lights. Plus I have my travel kit. Most of you do not need that many lights. But here's what you do. And I've talked about this before. So I'll, I'll keep this quick because I know some of you have probably already heard this. The best thing to do when you're starting out with lighting is, and you're getting ready to get into to strobes of some kind, do your research between uh, the different brands. Like, So look at Godox. Look at Profoto. Look at the Westcott. Even, you know, look at some of the, the off brands that are there. The problem is you're not going to get much of a system out of them. But look at them, right? Uh, certainly, you know, if you got the money, you can look at, you know, units like Elon Chrome, all those. There, there's a bunch. But do your research. Find the lights that are the size that you want, the power that you want, and have the accessories that you want. When I switched to Godox, if you remember back in the day, I used to use the, the Honey Badgers from Interfit for a while. And prior to that, I was a Pulsey Buff guy until Pulsey Buff died. And then the company started, in, stopped innovating, right? Um, I already had a lot of Bowen's mounts for my modifiers. So another thing that was important to me when I switched over to Godox is, am I able, going to be able to use my Bowen's mount stuff? Well, with the Godox S mount holders, I can use my Bowen's mounts. So that was also important. I didn't want to have to get all new modifiers. I liked my modifiers, right? So, but what you want to do then is you want to put your credit cards away. Like, no joke, put your credit cards away. Get a piece of paper, or if you're digitally inclined, use, you know, a note-taking app. And you want to basically map out your dream lighting system. You're not thinking about money. You're thinking about what is the smartest system for you. How many lights does that include? How many stands? And that means you're going to do your research on stands. Make sure that the stands are going to support the weight that you want to put on. All that stuff. Put it on paper. Now, you're going to go get your credit card, and you're going to buy one of those lights, just one light, one stand, and one trigger. That's it. And when you get it home, you are going to practice creating good light with one light, one stand, and one trigger. No modifiers. I'll let you go to the dollar store and buy a foam board, piece of foam board for a reflector. That's it. Once you can consistently pick that camera up, turn that light on, and create decent light with one light, then you can go back to your list and you can buy the second light and a stand. You won't need another trigger, so you just need a light and a stand. But you can add a modifier, like an umbrella, if you're smart. Not a softbox, an umbrella. No matter how much money you spend on lighting modifiers, a shoot-through umbrella will always be the most versatile modifier that you will ever own. And it will be the least expensive one that you ever purchase. That's a fact. Regardless of what you wind up buying and using down the road, it will be the least expensive and most versatile, period. Right? So start there. So the idea is you're adding the lights one at a time. And why is that important? I'm going to show you with tonight's shoot breakdown. So we're going to kind of interlap these two conversations together here because I want to go ahead and I want to share with you the cover shot from today, and I'll be able to explain why you're going to build your lights one at a time. So the shot that you see in the cover today is a shot that I actually just did this shot yesterday. Uh, fortunately, it required 
very little post-production, even though I created the background from scratch, it's actually super simple to do. Um, I've been doing a lot with overlays to create my backgrounds lately. One of the things that I would encourage you all to notice, if you go take a look at my portfolio or if you scroll through my Instagram, sure, sometimes I have a white background or a black background or a gray background, but more often than not, I have backgrounds that are exclusive to Joe Edelman. Nobody else has those backgrounds because you can't buy those backgrounds because I created the backgrounds for my shots. And I usually do them in post-production, right? So let's do the quick walkthrough on, on this shot here. So the gear is usual. It's the Sony a7 IV, uh, the R4A, the 61 megapixel camera, done history, I've told you, sticking with the A7 IVs. Uh, the Tamron 70-180 that's version one. I have not upgraded to version two yet. Um, ISO 100, 250 a second, F8. Those are my standard studio settings. About 126 millimeter uh, on this one. The reason why I'm a little shorter than I usually am, usually I'm around 135 to 150, uh, is because of the big hairdo on top. So I zoomed out a little bit to accommodate that extra top space, okay? Uh, the lighting arrangement, you can see it here. So five strobes. In the front, we've got the key light with the white foam board on the bottom for reflecting some light. Two lights with amber gels, one on either side of the subject in the background to give a little bit of highlighting on the side. And I'm gonna show you that in really good detail in just a second. Um, one hair light, but it's a, a kicked back really far hair light. In other words, a traditional hair light is usually kind of like right over you. Like if you watch my forehead, if I back up to about there, you see how the, this side, see how the light starts coming onto my forehead, right? So this light's like right above me. Okay, in fact, here, if I switch there, you can see it. There it is, like right up there, okay? So it's not that far back. In the case of this particular one, I've got that hair light kicked back about three and a half to four feet behind her because I only wanted to get the top edging of the hair piece that she had, right? And then uh, on the floor for the black background, a little bit of magenta glow just a little bit. So the breakdown on this shot, and this is why you're gonna start out with one light on your list and then add a second and a third, right? It's to train your brain, literally to train your brain and to train you how to do lighting. But if you've already got strobes, and you're gonna try stuff like this. This is how I strongly encourage you to do it. Start your background and light your background. Set your exposure based on what you want your finished exposure to be. Remember, when you're in the studio, gang, you're God, right? You control the light. The light's as bright, as dark, as colorful, whatever, as you want. So again, my studio settings with strobe are almost always at 2 of a second at F8. So I know that's where I'm gonna work. So my camera's set at a 2 of a second at F8, and I'm gonna take a series of test shots with just the background light until I get the background, the brightness that I want it to be. Then I'll go ahead and I'll add in my rim lights, which you see in number two in the upper right, and they are very subtle. Now, in my finished picture, there's no hair along the side of the model's face, so that yellow is actually hitting the side of her face. But again, very subtle, not super bright, super blown out. Because remember, this is also a woman of color. So I don't want really bright, hot highlights that are going to distract from her. Third light is that hair light that I mentioned. But in, again, notice how far back it is on her head. That's because I have the light way behind her. I just wanted to give a little bit of magenta edging to the top of the hair buns that she has on her head. And then last but not least is the key light. Now, you might notice when I added that key light in, I'm not using a grid or anything like that. It did start to pull some of the color out of the top of the background. So the, the top of the background starts to get a little bit kind of like hazy. It's like a mix of a little bit of magenta and black. And that's okay because of the way that I'm gonna composite. 
But how do you fix that? You fix that by putting more distance between your subject and the background, right? If, if that's a problem, if you, if you need to not have that happen. Uh, or try and tweak your lighting arrangement if at all possible, if it doesn't interfere with the, the look that you want for the shot. And instead of having that light coming straight at the background, move it off angle so that it's coming across. But that's also going to give you a very different look on the face, right? In this case, it's not going to matter to me because what I'm doing in post, super simple. In the upper right, there's a the shot out of camera. So you see how the finished version of that looks, okay? Notice how subtle the yellow is. Like I said, it's not super bright. It's just to give a little accent. And then these four overlays that you see with screen mode and a little bit of masking are overlaid one on top of the other. The bottom two with the golden bokeh and the flare, they are overlaid and also Gaussian blurred by about 14 to really soften them up, okay? And so by putting each of those on top of each other on a screen mode on top of that magenta and black background, I wind up with this as the finished shot. You can see that all those highlight details in that are much blurrier than they are in the originals because, again, I've added Gaussian blur to them. One of the challenges that we all face when we buy backgrounds, whether it's a black paper background like this was done on, right? For, I use the Savage Seamless paper backgrounds. Or worse yet, if it's a printed background that's got some kind of a pattern or a texture or hand-painted background, the problem is after you've done a couple of shots with it, you've done a couple of shots with it. How many pictures do you want that are going to look exactly the same? Now, you know, maybe you're like a school photographer and you're doing volume work. Remember, there's always exceptions, okay? Then that makes sense. That's great. You can do a thousand of them on that. But if you're doing work that's creative and if you're doing work where you're trying to build out a portfolio or if you're selling the idea that your portraiture is unique, you can't tell somebody, hey, I do unique portraiture and then photograph them on the exact same background that you photographed 100 other people on. That takes the uniqueness away. So certainly some of the simple things are, you know, you can add gels on those backgrounds and that tweaks the color. But for me... I can create my own completely unique backgrounds by doing these overlays. And if you follow me for a while, in fact, I should have added this before. I'll add it after the show. If you follow me, you've seen the videos that I did a few years ago where um, I created pattern backgrounds like this and put them on a 65-inch television. Um, all different ways to do it. I still love the TV idea. It's just that this is actually even simpler yet. So I'm doing the original shot. In fact, here, let me go and flip back to that. I'm doing the original shot and essentially setting it up to accept everything I'm going to put on top. So yes, these colors and these lights, I had selected them before I did the shot. Now, some of you may be saying, well, yeah, but like, did you experiment to see how they go together? No. Should you? Yeah, if you're just trying it for the first time, experiment with it. Absolutely, experiment with it, right? So that when you, the key is when you get into the studio and you have a subject in front of you, you want to have a good sense of how's this going to work? How's this going to look, right? When you've done it enough, yeah, you start to become aware of like, okay, I know where I can take this. And then you're going to leave a little bit of flexibility for some, creative kismet to happen where hopefully it can still surprise you a little bit, which is exactly what I did. But again, that comes from practice and experience. When you're first starting it, it's very much worth your while to go ahead and um, put the time in and create these backgrounds in advance. And especially with the masking tools that Photoshop has now, it's super simple to select the subject, mask out the background, and drop this stuff in. Super super simple okay all right so back to the lights that's why i encourage you start with one then add a second and so on but unless you have an 
overwhelming, like knocking you in the head reason for 400 or 600 watt seconds, it makes no sense. Because keep in mind too, if a situation comes up where you're going to need more light, there's a couple ways to get that more light. One, you can go out and rent, because hopefully it's gonna be a situation where you're getting paid, in which case that rental fee gets billed to the client. The other option is, if you have two 200 watt second strobes and you use them both at the same time, now you have 400 watt seconds. Double the power. So if you decide after you're doing your studio work that you wanna go back and you wanna honor 2017 and overpower you know, everything outside so that you can underexpose the background by a stop and a half, you can put two of those lights together to get a 400 watt second strobe and it's still gonna be smaller and lighter than actually buying, and less expensive than buying the 400 watt second strobe. Then when you go into the studio, you've got two separate lights to work with. More versatility. That's what's nice about the Godox system. You can't do that with Profoto. You can't do that with Westcott. Not an option. Godox, you can. So yes, is Godox Chinese? Yes. Did Godox start out by copying, stealing, whatever, like a lot of stuff Profoto and Canon and others doing? Yeah, they did. But I gotta tell you, right now, I'm sorry, they've got a better system for lighting that meets photographers' needs than anyone else. Unless you're making a stupid amount of money, Profoto is a dumbass piece of product to buy. That's my opinion, and I stand by it. For that matter, even if you're making a lot of money, I can do what you're doing with Godox. I just can. Pro Photo, super high quality lights. They're great. But not for a speed light at $1,000. No. In fact, I had to laugh. There was a headline on one of the photography blogs. You know, their, their new one that they just announced. Or, no, not that they announced recently. But it was talking about a Pro Photo speed light. Uh, the best speed light for under $1,000. Really? It's because it comes in at like 900 and some dollars, right? Who's gonna spend $900 for a speed light? I'm sorry. That's, that's hobby. That's people with a whole lot of money to throw around. That's hobby. I know there's some people that I've really PISS off with that. I, I stand by it. The average person doesn't need it, period. All right, so where are we at? We're just about a quarter. We got 15 minutes. Uh, I want to talk a little bit on. Um, um, I want to talk a little bit about time management tonight, but let's see. Let's do some Q and A because that's important. And then, uh, if we have time, we'll do time management tonight. If not, I'll get into that next week. Okay. So um, let me just scroll back here to the beginning of the comments. Zoltan was talking right before we started. His favorite portrait lens is now the 25 millimeter f 1.7 on a micro four thirds system. Uh, he's having very good results with that in low light on micro four thirds. Oh my God. Yeah, good. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that Zoltan, that it is a nice lens. That was a fun lens to use. Um, let's see here, scroll along. By the way, Carl, I got your message in my talk knowledge community. You're going to Mac. Yeah, man. Welcome to the dark side. Uh, glad to hear that. Uh, Blair's question, catch lights need to be seen in both eyes, right? No. Yes. Kind of, depends, maybe. So here's the thing, right? Um, they need to be seen in both eyes if it makes sense to be seen in both eyes. So the whole point behind the catch light debate, um, rules, whatever, Blair, is that um, supposedly all of those rules in that catch light discussion are based on the idea of what would we see in real situations, right? So certainly, like, if you've got a person turned, and they're turned a lot, which I'm not a fan of, but if you do, well, you're probably not going to see a catch light in that back eye, de depending on where the light is, right? So should you see two lights, one in each, if that's where our brain would expect to see them? If it makes sense based on the physics? Yes, right? Um, I would look at it the other way around, if I were you. Instead of worrying about do I need to get two lights or two catch lights in it in the, 
you know, in the eyes. I would look at it more from the standpoint of asking yourself, why don't I have two catch lights? Or if you're missing a catch light, use that as a mental trigger to kind of gut check your lighting choice. Meaning, there's a good possibility that if you don't have two catch lights, that your lighting is not necessarily flattering. That's not a 100% rule, right? So, so that's the thing. So I would say, you know, instead of saying, hey, I'm supposed to have two catch lights, I would use the idea that I've only got one catch light as like the trigger, just to do a gut check, to really take a good look at your setup, you know, your test shots on your computer, or on the back of your camera, but take a look and say, you know, is this light really flattering? The whole, at the core of the whole catch light issue is the idea that catch lights bring life to the eyes, right? Uh, they just do. And that's what our brains expect, just like our brains expect the catch lights to be in the top half of the eye. Our brains do not expect catch lights to be at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. That's a bit as much of BS ever. But our brains do expect them to be in the top half of the eye. Why? Because that's where our lights go. That's where the sun is. That's why in Hollywood, when they make zombie movies, they put the lights down here so that the catch lights are in the bottom and so that the shadows are on the tops of the cheek and the nose because it's startling, right? Um, but I would be careful about stressing it out as a rule. If it doesn't make sense in a particular shot for two catch lights to be there, don't try to get two catch lights there, right? So I hope that helps, okay? Um, let's see, Nick, I'm probably channeling you a bit, but unless you're doing something truly exotic, uh, a few 8200s and some Amazon umbrellas and a roll of duct tape, you can do just about anything, yeah. Um, I, I completely agree, Nick. Um, let's see, scrolling on down here, what else do we got? Uh, Nick also says, plan a headshot to replicate an image with a unique background. Think Jackson Pollock. Whew, busy then, right? Um, I was considering getting someone to paint it in real life, but should I consider composite it in post uh, instead of real? You know, that's going to depend, Nick, on what you're doing with your subject, um, how much random stuff is coming off of your subject. Like, is the hair going to be really crazy and that, right? Like, if you've got... If you're using a fan and the hair's blowing all over, that can make the compositing a little tough. So it, it depends on exactly what you're trying to accomplish, how you're going to accomplish it. You know, um, if it was a shot like with a fan, I'd be inclined to do to do it digitally, but put it on a TV and use the TV as a background, right? Um, if it's going to be a nicely styled stationary shot like the one that I you know did tonight then, um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can still get away with um, doing the composites after the fact. And, and even, even with blowing hair, you can still do compositing after. So I don't have it queued up on my machine, but here, if I go over here, if you guys look down here at this picture, uh, you haven't seen it online yet. I'll be sharing it in the next day or two, so you guys are seeing it first. Um, this is the same young lady, and it's a similar setup to the shoot that I showed you guys last week, which was this one, right? Remember, and I, I showed you how um, I did, whoop, there it is, I did the overlays for that, right? So um, this picture, done the same way, uh, except you'll notice her hair's blowing. So there's a, there's a fan involved, but with that type of overlay, it's really easy to get away with it, with the crazy hair. Um, as I imagine a Jackson Pollock painting, since it's, you know, this is all highlights here, right? Uh, as I imagine a Jackson Pollock painting, it's not going to have the same kind of highlights. It may be tough if it's crazy hair. So those are the things that you have to really think through, but um, doing it digitally is going to be a ton cheaper than actually painting it in in real life, and and that's for me, gang. That's the whole point behind it. So it's not because I'm cheap; it's because I'm being practical, right? Um, backgrounds are expensive, even if it's a paper background. They're expensive. That's eighty to one hundred bucks for a roll of paper, right? 
So how many, how, you know, how many are you going to buy? How often do you want to have to replace that? So are you going to become a slave to the idea that you can't go out and buy a new background every time you shoot? And I am not suggesting any of you should do that. Or are you going to find creative solutions? I'm all about finding creative solutions, right? I want to find creative solutions to be able to make my images more unique. And the best part of this concept, not only are my images more unique, they're mine. Nobody else has those backgrounds. There may be backgrounds that are similar. People have had similar concepts. That's cool. But nobody's got that background. There's not another picture that exists with any of these backgrounds that I've showed you. Because I created them. Right? So that's, that's the real, for me, that's the benefit uh, from doing that. Eric says here, uh, I'm so glad to hear you say that about pro photo. At some point, uh, I thought I wasn't getting something uh, wrong or missing some point about the price of that brand. No, I mean, you know, Eric, and again, I, I always like to make this really clear because I do have kind of harsh words for pro photo. So we know they'll never be sponsoring me, right? Um, I've owned Pro Photo before, so let me be really clear. Number one, I speak from a, you know, the, the standpoint of someone who has paid for Pro Photo heads in the past. This was easily more than 10 years ago now. Uh, I had one of them literally catch on fire in the middle of a shoot, which, let's be clear, that could happen to any electronic flash of any brand. So I'm not saying that that is, you know, something that's indicative of Pro Photos. Uh, and this was long before they had all the LED screens and, and everything as well. Here's what I, you know, we'll say factually about Profoto. Uh, very high quality lights, very high quality color from those lights. But unless you are doing work that requires extreme color control, meaning like if you've just been hired to, you know, uh, replicate the Mona Lisa, you better get the colors right. And getting the colors right isn't just color balance, but it's also color relationships. So while you can color balance a light source, if that light source isn't pure to begin with, it changes the relationships of the colors in a painting. That would not be acceptable if it was not super high quality light. So those are the kind of places where Profoto is great. But for all these people to go out and buy these Profoto lights as well, especially for amateurs that buy Profoto lights, or for younger photographers, newer photographers, Go look at Profoto's website. Profoto's play on both sides of the fence. They are not only selling the most expensive studio lights on the market for photographers like all of you, but they are also selling automated solutions for retailers to photograph their products and their clothing so that they don't have to hire photographers like you. Not making that crap up, gang. Go look at their website. Okay? Um, to me, it's two great reasons not to even consider them. And I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm keeping it real. Remember, I use Godox. If you're watching this, you are not doing photography that requires pro photo strokes. You're just not. And I'm, I'm not saying that to be a jerk. I'm just saying, hey, listen, if you were doing photography that actually required pro photostropes, you wouldn't need to be watching me. Period. Unless you were really bored and hoping I was going to do a rant. Right? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it honestly, it makes no sense for the average um, photographer. Cooley, how many S mounts do you have? Um, probably about eight, but I rarely ever use them. The only reason I have that many Cooley is because I had bought a bunch when they first came out. And then down the road, they came out with the ones that have the little piece in the bottom that you can slip out. So you can put like the 80, uh, 300 in it and the 80, 100. Um, and I went out and bought more. I only have one 80, 300, but the reason why I bought more uh, for LEDs, you may remember I have the Stella Pro, Stella Pro Reflex lights. The Stella Pro Reflexes fit perfectly inside the S-mount with the base out so it's got the round head. That allows me to use my Bowens mount modifiers with the Reflex lights, which you wouldn't have seen me talking about Reflex lights and using Reflex lights if I couldn't use my Bowens modifiers. 
that's why I didn't switch over to LEDs and use panels. Is I didn't want to have to switch to LED and then think about the way I modify and use the light differently. I want to be able to do what I do. And I do it with modifiers that go on Bowen's mounts and with umbrellas and things like that. So, so that's why I did it. So I've got a bunch, but I, it's not like I actually need that many. It's just because I got them in two different waves, if you will. Okay. Um, Fernando, I love my umbrellas. Umbrellas are still the best, always be the best. Um, let's see here. Uh, Danny, Godax introduced a new V1 Pro speed light. Yeah, and uh, s sorry, Danny, but round-headed speed lights make no sense. They just don't, right? If you understand the inverse square law and you understand that your camera sensor is a rectangle, There's just no benefit to a speed light that's got a round head. It's just not. So um, let's see here. Um, JD Strobus, my pleasure. You're very welcome. Um, F89, how good is the water resistance of the Stellar Pro lights? Um, the reflexes, the reflex S, which I have, um, I don't believe they are water resistant at all. I should know that answer, and I'm sorry. Um, I don't believe they, um, they are, okay? Um, the CLX-10s, the 8s, all those lights, yeah, they, they're like dive lights. You can put them suckers in water and go to town. Um, Stella Pro started as a dive lighting manufacturer, right? So their specialty is actually underwater lighting. Um, so yeah, th those lights are like, you know, that's the upside downside, like the CLX 10, which is an awesome light, super bright. Um, the downside is the, the battery is built in. So while you can recharge it, if you're out on a shoot and the battery goes dead, the lights bricked, right? You've got to have a separate power source with you. Um, so that's, you know, the other cha challenge, if you're going to use those lights, uh, for location work and things like that you need to, to take a separate um, a separate power source. So uh, F-89, I plan to shoot in the rain and I don't want to keep using my speed lights with a plastic bag over it. Uh, you don't want to be using LEDs yet outdoors in a situation like that, F-89, no. Um, I would use the speed lights in the rain with a plastic bag over it because it's a whole lot easier. Put them in a Ziploc bag, man, you're good to go. Like, yeah, I've actually, I've even done that with my, my Godox 8200s and been just fine. I mean, you know, part of it is you got to ask yourself, how often are you actually shooting in the rain? And, and, and honestly, why? And why are you using strobe in the rain? Because you do realize strobe in the rain, that's a nasty business. I'm not even talking about the idea that your stuff's going to get wet. I'm talking about the fact that you're going to light up the raindrops too. So depending on where you put that strobe, you're going to be lighting raindrops between you and the subject which means you're not gonna see the subject for the raindrops. And the raindrops are potentially gonna be overexposed compared to the subject if they're closer to the light. So part of the real challenge you have is I, I would try and avoid using strobe in the rain. But, yeah. but I've, I've had strobes out in the rain. I use them for background lighting. Um, with, you know, the hose and the water and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, and okay, so my, he just came back. It's to light up the raindrops behind the substance. As long as you're just using it behind, yeah. But you got to ask yourself, how often are you going to do it, right? I mean, how, how many pictures do you need uh, of people with lit up raindrops behind them? So to me, why buy a lighting system for that occasional use thing? I mean, again, that's, that's the thing you got to understand about gear, gang, right? Don't buy gear because I might use it. That's such a bad philosophy. It's a horrible philosophy. If you got the money to do that, send me some. Seriously. I've never run my business that way. I, I wouldn't have survived in a business. Most photographers wouldn't. 
You buy what you need, you improvise what you don't. You are supposed to be creative thinkers. What is creativity? Problem solving. Just saying, gang. Don't buy something because you might use it once. That's exactly what the manufacturers want you to do. And that's why they keep coming out with new stuff. You know, like this, new, this modifier's got yellow stripes. And some YouTuber says, it's the best one ever. And then takes a self-portrait with his face eight inches from the softbox. So it must be incredible. Like, come on. Right? No. You, you don't need to buy that stuff. Improvise that stuff. Ziploc bags are the greatest rain covers for speed lights. Always have been, always will be, period. And I'm sure somebody probably makes rain covers, but that's the point. Why would you spend money for that? Unless you're going to do it all the time. Most of you aren't, in which case, improvise, right? So, Hector, and then we're going to go here. Uh, I have my wildlife camera trap flash inside a spaghetti plastic container sitting in the forest for a year now. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, there you go. That's the point, right? Um, I've always been in the mentality. That's a big part of the fun of photography because that's the kind of stuff that actually gives me an advantage, right? Other photographers won't do things because they can't think their way or they're too lazy to think their way to a solution. If I put in the effort and I find a solution, I've got an advantage, just like these backgrounds that I'm showing you guys. All of you that do studio work wishing, gosh, I wish I could afford more backgrounds, but backgrounds are expensive. These backgrounds don't cost me a freaking dime. And, and even if I were to go out and buy some of these overlays, you can buy like hundreds of overlays for a couple of bucks, right? So you could make endless amount of backgrounds, super, super, super cheap. But it's a matter of putting a little bit of effort to do it, right? So anyway, that being said, gang, we will do time management next week because I didn't want to rush through that one uh, because it's something that's not just about business. It um, applies to um, pretty much everything. John, I see your question about the, um, the S-mount. It's just Google Godox S-mount, and that's what I put it in. Super simple. So it allows you to attach a Bowens uh, modifier, and it mounts on a stand, and it swivels. Super simple. Okay? All right, gang, uh, hopefully, if you're still here watching, come on, you must have found some value in this, right? Please hit that thumbs up before you go. Help me get the word out. Um, and um, where am I at here? There we go. We're out of time. So thank you for watching. I do hope you found some value in what I shared with you tonight. Uh, we'll be back again next week. More cool stuff. Another shoot breakdown, along, of course, with the last frame Q&A. Uh, and if you can't make it to the show, just like tonight, Leave your question in the comments below, and I'll answer it for the next show, all right? Um, but remember, gang, you don't get back the days that you waste, so please go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios.